Good morning, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We usually study 2 Corinthians on Sunday. I'm going to have to postpone that uh, this week. Uh, I'm going to try to give a summary of Philemon in a short video, so I've got quite a challenge ahead of me. And then we'll be back in 2 Corinthians next week. The letter's uh, generally regarded as one of the undisputed works of Paul. It, it's the shortest of Paul's letters, and it it consists of only 335 words. So uh, I'm going to try to do my best to uh, sort of sum that up for you. We don't have Philemon in our playlist. Uh, maybe in the future I may decide to go verse by verse through Philemon. It's a wonderful, wonderful epistle. Uh, I hope that you get a real blessing out of this. Philemon is a fabulous message from the Holy Spirit, and it's an illustration of what God has done for us in Christ Jesus. It's a marvelous example of that. Philemon's a businessman. He's apparently living in Colossae. Uh, how many slaves he had, we don't know. Uh, the Greeks and the Romans were not very kind to slaves. Roman law said that if a slave wronged his master in any way, that he should be put to death. Uh, in fact, uh, the Roman law said that if a slave killed his master, then every slave in, that, in the household would be put to death. Uh, one Roman prefect uh, who was killed by one of his slaves had owned over 400 slaves and so Roman law said that over 400 would have to be executed. And uh, that seemed just a little bit too much for much of the population. And so there was a protest. And so the Roman Senate met on this. And their decision was that the law should be carried out. And so Roman legions held back the crowd while over 400 slaves were put to death. Paul was imprisoned in Rome. So here's a slave by the name of Onesimus who in, in whatever way wronged his master, we don't know. I don't know what that was. He fled to Rome just in time to see over 400 slaves put to death. Knowing full well that he also was under the law, condemned to die. Now listen carefully, because this gets really good. And there was nothing at all that Onesimus could do. If he goes back to Philemon, he'll die. If he appeals to any court, or he throws himself, tries to throw himself on the mercy of the court, he'll die. He has a perfect illustration that there is no mercy when it comes to slavery. Over 400 are, are being put to death as he arrives in Rome. He saw this. Now I have heard uh, a number of messages on this. Uh, some of them w which said, well, as luck would have it, Onesimus, he runs into Paul. Really? You know, the last place that Onesimus would have ever wanted to go is prison, is to prison officials. You know, hi, I'm Onesimus. You know, I'm a runaway slave. I'd like to talk to Paul. It, folks, if there was ever an illustration of the sovereign majesty of God, the sovereign direction of God in the lives of His people, it's, it's with Onesimus. No man can come unto me except my Father, which in heaven draw him, drag him, force him. No greater example than Onesimus. We see the hand of God in the life of Onesimus. What possibility could the human mind ever conceive that, that a runaway slave would ever meet a prisoner in a Roman prison? But, but it, it happened. 
Well, he well he was caught up shoplifting and, and, and put in jail. No way. No way. That would have been the end of Onesimus. How they met, I do not know, but I do know that they met by the sovereign direction, the sovereign power of the almighty, majestic God. And the Holy Spirit, through the Apostle Paul, also had the opportunity to tell Onesimus that he belonged to Christ. The Gospel is not that you could belong to Christ if you want to. You know, there's some kind of an invitation. You can go to hell if you want to. You can go to heaven if you want to. No. Here's an opportunity, you know, to believe in a, 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 a sovereign God who works all things together for the good. The good news is, Onesimus, you are mine. I died for you. I bought you. And the message of Philemon, the message of Philemon is not some historical account of a runaway slave who, who through the intercession of the Apostle Paul is restored to his master without punishment. That's not the message. Dearly beloved, it is a marvelous illustration of the grace of God in our lives. It's an illustration of how He knows us. He seeks us out. When Adam sinned, I've heard, I've heard people say, you know, sin drives you to Christ. No, no it doesn't. It drives you away from Christ. When Adam sinned, he ran, and God went looking for Adam. Adam didn't go looking for God. It was God who found Onesimus, and it was God who said, you're mine. Before time began, I chose you. Before time began, began I sowed you. I, I planted you. Well, why would you plant me as a slave and, and lead me to leave my master? I, I, can, I can hear him saying that. And folks, the passive voice in verse 15, Philemon 1.15, says that he was made to leave Philemon. Made to leave. I'm not going to suggest to you that I know the mind of God other than, than what He's revealed in His Word. But I know that for every one of you who belong to Christ, you've never been out of His sight. You've never been out of His mind. You've never been out of His hand. That everything that's ever touched your life in any way has touched your life that God might mold you and make you what He wants you to be. What a wonderful epistle. I encourage you to take the time to read it. I've suggested in other studies, many studies in fact, that I find it so, that it's so easy for Christians to praise God for all of the good things in their lives. But I don't hear Christians praising God too much for all the bad things. You know, for the sin. I believe that God teaches us more through failure than He, than he teaches us through success. If there is any danger in your life, lives, believe me, dearly beloved, the danger comes from success, not from failure. It is success that leads us to believe that we are self-sufficient. That we don't need God. And we don't need His grace. And we don't need His direction. You know, we're captains of our, our, our fate. And we determine our destiny. Dearly beloved, success is a dangerous field to play in. God had placed Onesimus right where He wanted him. He placed him where he was. We see illustrations of that. Um, imagine the stupidity of His disciples, you know, saying, well, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Uh, not, not exactly sure how that he could sin in his mother's womb, but that was the question on the disciples' mind. And what did Christ say? Christ said He didn't sin. 
His parents didn't sin. This was done in order that the power of God might be shown in him. If God wants to, to show his power in you, what better service could there be? What a marvelous opportunity that the sovereign, majestic God of all creation, the majestic God of all eternity, would decide to use me in any way to demonstrate His grace, His power, His love. Onesimus was always His. He didn't run into Paul by accident. This is what's interesting about it. We see Onesimus under the threat of death. Could he do something to earn his freedom? No. Cast himself on the mercy of the court? No. No, he's already had a vivid illustration that there is no mercy there. And folks, there is no mercy in law. The law must be fulfilled and we stood condemned under the law and therefore we were the slaves of sin and the law and then Christ came as our kinsman redeemer. God was not capable of redeeming us apart from the incarnation. And so Almighty, eternal God became flesh, walked among us, he became man. He had to become man. He had to become flesh. He had to tabernacle among us, be our kinsman redeemer, in order that he might meet the demands of the law. We see Onesimus going back to Philemon, not with money, not with apology, but with mediation, demanding grace. And all through Philemon, we see illustrations of the finished work of Jesus Christ. Of the sovereign power of God in the, in the, in the direction of our lives. You'll, folks, you'll never know. You will never know that you trust Him, that you believe Him, that you rest in Him until you're in troubled waters. You know, just take it from an old Navy guy, all right? Smooth seas do not lead you to trust. The only option Onesimus had was to spend the rest of his life running. And it's not a good option from a human standpoint. You know, the odds are very high that he's going to be caught. He's got to eat. He has to live. And when he's arrested, he won't be able to prove citizenship. And if he's a slave, they'll find out who he belongs to. He doesn't have any hope. Just as you and I had no hope. He doesn't have any hope. No way can he remedy his condition. No way can he pay the debt. Now the mediation comes based on grace. Read Paul's words in this epistle. And we find that the mediator appealed on the basis of what he had done. And the basis of the mediation that we see on our behalf is the finished work of Jesus Christ. You are complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power. Now, if you're complete in Him, what is there left to be done? You know, there's a, there's a parable that leaven was taken and, and, and put in the lump until the, the whole lump was leavened. And there, there are all kinds of arguments about you know, whether that's righteousness or sin. In my personal humble opinion, I believe that the Holy Spirit 
is, is pointing out to us that the religious system is headed toward evil. Many of you are familiar with Martin Luther. I'm not talking about Martin Luther King, the Martin Luther, the, the theologian. You know, he had a very close companion named uh, Melanchthon, and they were friends. And Melanchthon, he opened just a, a little tiny hole in the matter of redemption that a person had to crawl through in order to be redeemed. Luther taught that man had absolutely nothing to do with his redemption, which, was true, which is true. There, there was no synergism at all involved in the new birth. They were born again by, by God from above. That man did not cooperate with God in his redemption. And Melanchthon said, well, that's not quite right. I believe that man can do nothing to affect his redemption except except Jesus Christ. Now, how did he put that in there? Because it's not there in the text. What right did Melanchthon have to handle the Word of God that way? Just make something up and, and throw it in there. I, I wish I, I could... I could read for you his quote. Now, I don't have really time to go all into all of that, but Luther wrote a scathing treatise on this little tiny exception, and he said it, it, it's, not, it's not much that Melanchthon's asking for, but it will lead to a lot, and, and it has. It has, dearly beloved. Until, in, in essence, the Christian community today is not only synergistic in its evangelism, but but is suggesting that man initiates the process of redemption. That God is powerless until man acts. Folks, that is not biblical. Onesimus finally confessed to Paul that he was Philemon's slave. And Paul says, oh, basically says, oh, Philemon's a good friend of mine. Isn't that wonderful? That's the gospel. Imagine what must have happened in the heart of an essence. I know God, says Jesus Christ. And the mediation is a mediation of grace. There was absolute confidence because of what he had done. Having confidence in his obedience. And I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which, which I have committed unto him against that day. In your authorized version, the, the word uh, obedience, I believe, is a poor choice in the authorized version. Compliance is, is how I would translate that. Having absolute confidence in thy compliance because I know, I know that, that you will do more than I say. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and able to do more than we could possibly ask or think, it's, it's exactly the same expression. Folks, grace is always the arena in which more is done, not less. In verse 22, we read, prepare me also a lodging, the place to dwell. For I trust that through your prayers, I shall be given to you. Make ready your hospitality. I suppose a great number of Christians anticipate standing before God where God deals with sin you know, Lord, I, I'm really, I'm really sorry for all the rotten, filthy things I ever did. I'm sorry I did that, and I, and I know, I know, I, I, don't, I didn't have any excuse. And when, and when we go down through your whole life, listing all of the trash, all the garbage through which you've walked, 
and yet we read here a message that it's going to be gracious hospitality. Dearly beloved, I hope you see that. I trust that, that through your worship I shall be given to you. The word given there is didomai. It has to do with a, a gracious forgiveness, gracious fellowship, fellowship without condemnation, without fault. And it reminds me of Colossians when we studied through that marvelous epistle. That through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, we stand before God holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. You don't anticipate going to heaven to face condemnation, but hospitality, gracious acceptance. What a verse. And of course, we know from Romans chapter 8, verse 1, there's therefore now no condemnation to those of you who are in Christ Jesus. There's a kernel of the good news that ought to be stressed. Why don't you live as though there's no condemnation? And suddenly you're you're tied by chains of love, not by chains of law. And then, of course, we know, we, we, we read in John 14, I go to prepare a place for you. Philemon gives us the confidence that we are all to be reunited in the family, in the household of God. Now, maybe that's not very interesting to you. But dearly beloved, I can't think of a thing I'm doing that's better than heaven. But without any doubt, Philemon forces us to believe that Jesus Christ's sacrifice was sufficient. Nothing more needs to be done. People read Philemon, and, and they want to put it in a, a human frame. You know, the, this is simply a story of a slave in Esimus and his master Philemon. I, and folks, I don't deny the historical aspect of the account, but what is the message to us? What is the message that the Holy Spirit is trying to convey here to us? It's not important to me whether Paul thought that you know, he might be released and he might get back to Philemon or not. I, I think he was. I think he was released. I think he did go back and, and see Philemon. Others don't. Others do not believe that he was released. I think he was arrested a second time and beheaded. But be that as it may, Those are important historical facts, but what is of greater importance, I believe, is what is the Scripture teaching us? That Jesus Christ is, is confident that the debt is paid, that it, it's sufficient, and He's confident that we'll be in fellowship together in God's household. All I'm suggesting is there's a greater message than the historical fact that there's a, a, a man in prison hoping to see a friend Philemon at Colossae and that that confidence, that confidence is resting upon what Christ has done. And now as the letter ends, we see some names in the last three verses of Philemon. We, we have some names, and it's, it's interesting that God knows my name, that He knows your name. Yosemite Sam doesn't know my name. You know, Donald Duck you know, doesn't know my name. The governor of the state of Oklahoma does not know my name. 
I doubt Joe Biden knows my name. I doubt Donald Trump knows my name. I don't think my horse knows my name. But God knows me by name. He knows you by name. He says that he's branded your name on the palms of his hands. How fabulous is that? How, how wonderful that the eternal majesty on high knows my name. And so he names some of them. And in the same way that God knows them, he knows you. Epaphras, my, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. These are fellow laborers. In Galatians, we read that Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed into Thessal Thessalonica. Apparently, this epistle is a much later epistle. Damas is back with him. There's no word of condemnation here. You don't read anything like that. I don't think that you should take that verse. Damas has forsaken me as though Damas went to hell. You know, you know, here's a Christian you know, who turned back and now he's headed for hell. Folks, you can't support that from Scripture. You can't make it say that. Demas is no longer with me. I think, I think we, we put too much in the word forsake. Apparently he was interested more in the world system than he was the gospel. And now he's back working with Paul. I do not think that the Holy Spirit's intent was to single out Demas and just to, you know, but to show us that we're known by name. He knows us. He knows who we are. He knows where we are. He knows the paths that we take, and when He's tested us, we shall come forth as gold. The 21st verse closes out the epistle with the words, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. There's only one other place that this, this ending occurs, and that's in the book of Galatians where that we read that we walk in the sphere of grace, not in the sphere of law. That we were under sentence of death, just like Onesimus, with absolutely no ability to remedy that condition. And in that condition, Christ paid the debt. So that now through his mediation, we can stand before God. Everything credited to the account of Christ. If he owes you anything, says Paul. Don't miss this. If he owes you anything, says Paul to Philemon, put that on my account. And we stand before Christ blameless. Marvelous, marvelous truth. But the flesh doesn't stand there. I know that you walk in the sphere of grace. But the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is with your spirit. Your spirit. That's why whosoever is born of God does not commit sin because his seed remains in him and he has no ability he has no power at all to sin. The new man cannot sin. That's all the old man does. But the new man can't sin. It's the new man. It's the reason that Paul could declare in Romans 7, that which I do I would not, and that which I would not, that I'll, th these I allow. Therefore it is not I who sins, but sin that dwells in me. Dearly beloved, you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. All things have indeed become new. And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is ever with that new creation. You cannot get out 
of that sphere of grace. To do that intellectually is to return to law. Now he which is born, and we read this in Galatians, he which is born of the, of the flesh persecutes him that is born of the spirit. So what says the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. Just move for a moment in your minds from Ishmael and Isaac to the old man and the new man. The old will be cast out. In fact, it's, already, it's been crucified with Christ. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. I believe in the historicity of this account. I, I believe that a prisoner named Paul is writing from Rome to a man in Colossae named Philemon concerning a slave named Onesius. I believe that. But I also believe that the epistle illustrates the, the grand truth, the marvelous truth of God's sovereign operation of grace and love in the lives of his family as it concerns both redemption as well as their ongoing relationship with him. Security, provision, fellowship, worship, and even heaven. I love you all. I truly do. Rest in him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.